1939, I was at school in the sixth form and I'd been accepted for a place at Exeter College to train as a handicraft teacher. As soon as war was declared, the college closed down because they were going to train the munition workers in their workshops. So I had to cancel that course. But prior to that, in the beginning of 1939, when war was imminent, uh, a friend and I went on a series of civil defence lecturers to qualify as a messenger in, into the civil defence. So that when war broke out, I didn't go to Exeter, I joined a teacher training course which uh, Bath had for training pupil teachers on the job and went into the civil defence. As a messenger, you had a certain amount of street cred because you had a tin hat and a civilian duty gas mask where everybody else had a little one in a box. Uh, when war broke out, I was appointed to the fire station as a messenger to the fire station. The job there was to take a bicycle and when the engines went out, you were a runner on a bicycle because radio contact and that was uh, uh, not, not, not so common in those days. The training was to find out where all the static water tanks were, where there was um, water supplies like the royal baths, swimming pools and things like that that could be used, where the warden's posts were, because your main job really would have been if there was a raid on the city and engines from the outside were brought in, you would probably get up on one of the engines and they were told to go to the assembly rooms or somebody like that. You'd direct them through the streets. May the 14th, 1940, when the invasion and uh, Dunkirk was over, there was an announcement on the radio that uh, they were forming the local defence volunteers. So I thought uh, a rifle and a service gas mask is one better than a, <laughs> a tin hat and an ordinary gas mask. So I joined the uh, LDV. Now, the local defence volunteers were only a name, and it was in July, I think, that the name was changed to the Home Guard. Uh, we were a rather rustic unit to start with. I can remember the platoon that was formed was the Barhampton platoon and our job was to so say guard the dry archer spot on the Warminster Road that looked down the Limplestoke Valley which would be an approach from the south to Bath. Uh, my first patrol was on the back of a motorbike uh, both in civilian clothes. The chap in front had a 12-bore strung across his back with a cord and I had a piece of uh, the ubiquitous scaffold pipe with a bayonet stuck in the end of it and our job was to patrol the local golf course. I suppose if a parachutist was to come round we would go underneath him and I was to <laughs> hold the bayonet for him to land on. Uh, but fortunately they, um, they didn't come. The Home Guard was a more organised unit uh, by the autumn, uniforms and weapons started coming through. We had two nights training in Bathampton, where we did the usual sort of uh, infantryman training, um, how to prime a mills bomb, how to throw it, how to fix a bayonet, how to stick a bayonet into a sack of straw, uh, how to crawl with a rifle, um, how to take cover, and the, that, that sort of general training. Yes, it was very interesting because I was a teenager, I was with adults, many of whom had been in World War I. Uh, they were a friendly crowd. I recognised a number of them in Dad's army. <laughs> very, very, very similar faces in some places. And yes, it was, it was very good. The Home Guard used to meet each weekend and we used to man a dugout on the Warminster Road. And if I could just divert a moment, uh, we were called out on in September the 4th, I think it was, when the church bells rang and they put knife rests across the road to stop people. And myself and a friend were on guard duty and two or three bicycles were coming out of town. Obviously the lads had been out on the town and the sergeant was there. And as they came down the road, he said, stop those men. So I called, halt, who goes there? And the comic on the front bike said bandwagon and the sergeant said I'll bandwagon you you bees and he took his stick and he stuck it straight through the front wheel of the first bicycle. The chap went top of a tail over the bicycle and landed in a heap and he said that'll teach you to stop the next time you're told to stop. If they'd done that on Dad's army people probably wouldn't have believed it but uh, it was there. And it was shortly after that we were again on patrol on guard duty outside 
and uh, my friend Tony Hunt, who was similar age to myself, said, uh, would you like to join something more exciting than the Home Guard? And I said, yes, what is it? He said, well, I can't tell you. Uh, I'll take you in town next week. So two or three days later, I met him, and he took me to a chap called Jack Wilde in Bathwick Street. And he said, I understand you're interested in joining my lot. And I said, well, what's your lot? And he said, well, I'll tell you later on. And he asked me a lot of questions about my family, how long I'd been there, uh, did I know my way around, could I live off the land for a couple of days, and that sort of thing. He said, well, come back in a week. So I came back in a week, and he said, well, yes, you're all right. Uh, sign this and you can join. So I signed it, and I said, what's that? He said, that's the Official Secrets Act. <laughs> He said, now I can tell you what you've joined. And he said, you've joined the auxiliary units, uh, which is going to be an underground unit in case of invasion. Uh, I understand from Tony that Jack Wilde had met him in Bathwick Street. And as a sprightly upright young man, had suggested he might like to join. And he passed it on to me. Well, the auxiliary units were formed when an invasion was imminent. Churchill had a lot of experience in the Boer War of commando Boers working behind the lines and he knew the damage that uh, a free moving unit could do behind enemy lines so it was kept quiet. So when invasion was imminent, I should think it must have been May 1940, he instructed uh, General Ironside, who was uh, CNC Home Forces, to form a, a, a resistance unit. Uh, in July, I think it was July, Ironside got Colonel Gubbins, who later formed the SAE, SOE, the French uh, Resistance Operative, to set up this uh, underground unit. The purpose of the unit was to go underground in case of invasion, come up behind, and mainly attack supplies, munitions, petrol dumps. They weren't trained as a unit to have a confrontation, a firefight, or anything like that. Uh, as the instructors at Coles Hill told us, um, if they see you, you're dead. So you had to make sure you weren't seen. So it was trained to be an underground unit. Ironside set up the Ironside line, which was a defence line, stop line in case of invasion, running from Scotland right down to the south, running round to uh, London, Southampton, Portsmouth, and... Bristol and Plymouth, and the auxiliary units were mainly based between that stop line and the coast. The stop line consisted of pillboxes, uh, natural defences, rivers, fortified villages and so on, and it was assumed that in an invasion the first rush would get ashore, they would be stopped at the stop line, and the auxiliary units would act as sabotage units to hinder their advance, hinder their supply lines. The auxiliary units were very secretive. Everything was on a need-to-know basis. Uh, we didn't know the name, full names, of all the members of the patrol. There were nicknames, Donk and Buster, and you knew them by that. You didn't ask who they were, and you didn't know where all of them lived. Uh, we knew the sergeant, and the sergeant obviously had contacts outside the auxiliary units. Uh, we knew there was a captain because he turned up now and again just to see how we were getting on and talking. And it wasn't until the reunion of the stand down in 1994 that I realised that we were one of ten patrols around Bath. There were five based on 5 Battalion Home Guard and five based on 6 Battalion, the Admiralty Home Guard. Um, I even found out uh, I played rugby in the scrum with one bloke who was an auxiliary, and we had another auxiliary on the wing, but none of us knew the others were in the auxiliary units, none of us knew where the OBs were, and it wasn't until after 1994 that I researched the units and found out where all ten OBs were and made contact with other members. It's sometimes thought that the auxiliary units were the home guard, they weren't. The auxiliary units merely used the Home Guard as a cover for moving around. We wore a Home Guard flash and were instructed to say, if anybody said, what unit do you belong to? Well, we're headquarters, because that was vague enough to, uh, to, to cover up anything. So that was um, completely uh, gone.
completely anonymous. To start off with, it was basic, because as I've said, we weren't an attack force, but we were a sabotage force. So our initial supplies were what they called um, Aux Unit 1, which came in a cardboard box, and which consisted of um, Jelignite, uh, Noble 808, uh, quite a lot of fuse detonators, uh, a little bit of plastic explosive, which even the army didn't have in those days, and believe it or not, uh, a bronze casting about this size, which looked like a lump of coal, which you were supposed to stuff full of explosive and put in a train tender <laughs> or something to blow the train up. Uh, it wasn't long, though, before supplies improved tremendously, and by mid-41, we were getting quite well equipped. Uh, personal equipment, um, Churchill signed a memo uh, from uh, Gubbins saying these men should have revolvers, and revolvers started coming in from America. But of course the, the supply from America was difficult because the Congress was isolationist and wouldn't permit war orders from the UK here, so they had to be uh, scrounged and sorted. There was a, an organisation, I think, called uh, Protect British Homes, and they would buy, they bought 400 Colt 32s, which they sent across privately, and uh, the son of the uh, American ambassador sent a load of Thompson submachine guns across, and they scrounged a number of 32 revolvers from the New York Police Department, which came across in New York Police Department holsters. I've got one, I'll show you. <laughs> uh, 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 things like that. But we got issued with the Fairburn Sykes fighting knife very quickly. Uh, that is a very nice weapon. It was designed by Captain Fairburn and Sykes of the Shanghai Police as a commando fighting knife. And it's beautifully balanced, beautifully sharp and so on. And later on, we got the Thompson submachine gun and some got the Sten. And we got the standard P-17 rifle, which was issued to the Home Guard, and a 2-2 sniper rifle, silenced and telescopic sights. So safe for taking out German sentries, but used mainly for shooting rabbits <laughs> to, to support the wartime, uh, wartime rations. But the firearms were all very well, but when you think of our job as saboteurs, once you'd fired a gun, somebody knew where you were. So our main weapons were the explosives and incendiaries for destruction, uh, the garrote and knife and truncheon for getting rid of the sentry. And we were taught to, again by Fairburn and Sykes, how, how to be very nasty, uh, how to knife fight, how to get yourself out of trouble. If you use the firearms, it would be back up in a raid. Uh, if you were doing a petrol dump, you'd say send four out, two with the explosives and incendiaries for the petrol dump, one to stand by uh, with a smoke grenade, a uh, pistol, in case they were disturbed, mainly to listen, because if you're busy blowing up a petrol dump, you're not listening up for sentries, so he would watch them, and one standing back with a Thompson or something like that, so in the event of you being discovered, he could put down covering fire in the hope that you'd escape uh, and, and get away. We were issued very quickly with a supply of booby traps. Uh, um, I'll get his rank major, I think McCray ran what was known as Winston Churchill's toy shop. And they were part of the dirty tricks department and they produced time delay pencils, pressure switches, pull switches, um, pressure release switches and things like that from which you could make booby traps. Uh, and we got issued with those quite quickly. But uh, we also used to sit in a pub of a night and have a think tank and try and work out something for ourselves. And we came up with a number of quite, we thought, uh, in interesting devices. <clears throat> we found that uh, you could make quite an effective incendiary, I don't know if I should say this these days with terrorists being about, by taking a torch bulb, rubbing it on a piece of glass paper and exposing the filament, cardboard tube, a bit of black gunpowder on top of it, 
when you switched it on, it fused fired the gunpowder. You could put a detonator in that. You could put that in a tin. You could have a condom filled with petrol, put that in the tin, put it in, and you could put up a, a firing switch with two drawing pins so somebody pulled a drawer out, it made a contact, or something like that. Uh, the prize one, I think, oh no, two or three. We had one which was a pipe bomb, which we got a, a, a water pipe, filled it with uh, explosive, and then in the top of the pipe, screwed a T-junction. And into the top of the pipe, put a time pencil, which is a firing device with a delay on the top of it. We took the delay out, so the firing pin was held back by the safety pin, put a wire on that through the T-junction, screwed a tap on it, put the wire around the uh, washer on the tap, so that when you turn the tap on, it pulled the pin out, and the thing went bang, and the pipe bomb went off, and stuck it outside the house with a tap under it, hoping some thirsty German might want a drink of water one day, and do that. We made a simple trembler switch with a, a coil of wire, a vertical plumb coming in it, so that if you moved it, the vertical plumb touched the side, made a contact, put that in a cocoa tin, or put that in a biscuit tin or something like that, wired with a battery to a charge, to, to an electric detonator, so that if you moved it, the trembler switch went off and the, the explosive device went off. We had a decent little workshop in the, sh in, the, in the cellar, but I was training to be a craft teacher. I had the Technical College machine shop at my, at my disposal. <laughs> so so the, the, the trouble of tools, machines and that sort of thing, didn't exist. L lunchtime break in the Technical College workshop, you can make lots of things. The formal training, um, when Gobbin set up uh, the auxiliary units in July 40, I think it was, he took over Coles Hill House, which is a Palladian house, Highworth, just outside of Swindon, as the headquarters. And they used that as, as the training centre. Patrols used to go there at the weekend from Friday through Monday, I suppose about maybe 20 of us at a time. And it was staffed by what I think were um, Lovett Scouts, who were the beginners of the, the commando units. They were certainly rough lads, whoever they were. And they knew all the dirty tricks. And they would teach you unarmed combat, um, how to take out a sentry, how to set up an explosive charge, um, how best to blow a railway line, how to move quietly through a wood at night, uh, how to lie still if, if you're there in the wood and you hear something, for goodness sake, don't move, stay where you are, and demonstrated it by the fact that you walk right by somebody five or six feet away and not know, not know that they were there. Uh, they also taught us to... Um, come in on an attack, they used to put us in three, take us in a truck some, I don't know, three, four miles away from Coase Hill House, uh, give us a bearing as to where the direction of the house and a sketch map. And then we had to try and break into a lager which they set up and write chalk marks on trucks they had there. The only trouble was that they put the Lovett Scouts out as scout patrols and they were far brighter than us. And if they got you, my word, it was a rough, it was a rough trip back because they, they, weren't, they weren't at all gentle. Um, we managed one trip to get back to the uh, lager, but on one trip we were picked up and got thoroughly dusted over by the time we got back. Other things on training, we were lucky because Jack Wilde, our sergeant, was an explosives engineer. So when it came to explosives, we didn't need a manual or a book. Jack, Jack knew it all. He worked at one of the local quarries. In fact, our patrol got uh, one or two bits and pieces, I think, that were liberated from the quarries that other patrols didn't get, like, like electric detonators. A box of those would suddenly turn up. Other things on training, we were lucky because Jack Wilde, our sergeant, was an explosives engineer. So when it came to explosives, we didn't need a manual or a book. Jack, Jack knew it all. He worked at one of the local quarries. In fact, our patrol got uh, 
one or two bits and pieces, I think, that were liberated from the quarries that other patrols didn't get, like, like electric detonators. A box of those would suddenly turn up. Firearms and explosives are noisy. Uh, you could set up a charge, you could set up a booby trap and know that it worked by putting a, a light bulb on it that would fuse so that if it had gone, the bulb had fused and you know that the trip and, and the setup had worked. We set up practice ones, but very rarely one that would go off with a bang because we didn't want to attract attention to us. Uh, we'd set up a... If there was a track that was likely to be used, we'd set up a, a line of Mills bombs, perhaps 12 Mills bombs, connect them with instantaneous detonators, uh, instantaneous fusion detonators, and then a tripwire or a pressure switch, so that when they went... If a, if a patrol was walking along, the length of the Mills bomb should be the length of the patrol and, and, and take the patrol out. Uh, we practiced with incendiary devices because um, they just produced a nice blaze. And in the woods at Claverton, there was quite a lot of wooded and open land. And there were odd bangs during the war that were unexplained. That We did try out one or two to see what the effect was, but not... Um, you had a number of small caps that you could crimp onto the end of a fuse and just rub it with a, like a, like a match striker. But those were limited. Uh, if you tried to light a burning fuse, first any breeze would blow it out. Uh, if you used a protected lighter or something like, a light would give you away where you were. So we overcame the problem by taking the standard Bickford burning fuse and cutting a V-notch in it. And in that V-notch, inserting a red safety match. So the red head was against the running end of the fuse. Then making a small tube of cardboard, which was lined with glass paper, and sliding it on the fuse. Then if you held the end of the fuse and poured the glass paper along, it struck the match and the fuse went with just a minor spark when the match actually went. We found that quite successfully. And to protect it from the weather, we got the ubiquitous Comdom and tied it over the end so that it was weatherproof and you could still pour the, uh, the tube inside it. First of all, we were a young patrol. That's why I'm still around here to talk about it. We weren't the 40-year-old gamekeepers that were recruited into some of the other patrols. Uh, three of us... Four of us were for the same school. Uh, three of us played in the same rugby team. Uh, the others were that you knew. And you just got on, you were a group, you had a job. Uh, and as I say, trying to devise devices and things like that. It was really sort of like grown up scouts <laughs> almost. It was. Uh, it, it was a very welcome, and as, as opposed to the other patrols, well, we didn't know they existed. We knew there must be some because uh, we did attack on we did an attack on Green Park uh, Railway uh, Depot, and we joined up with three other people that we'd not met before. Well, we joined up with them in a, a, a shelter, weather shelter in a park. Who they were, where they came from, we don't know. We just sat, we talked out the plan, we carried out the night exercise and never saw them again. So we knew there were other auxiliaries around, but who they were, where they were, we didn't know. But the patrol was, yes, in fact, uh, the four of us still about. Can you tell me about the bomb, st the bomb store attack in April 1942? Yes, we had... Uh, a number of explosive stores about because uh, we didn't know quite what we'd need, when we'd need it. And this was one that was in an old quarry at the top of Woodcombe Hill and Bathwick Hill in Bath. And it was the store which they used to keep their explosives in. When the raid on Bath in April 42 came, a bomb dropped nearby that and cracked it, shifted sideways a bit. Unfortunately, it didn't uh, damage any of the contents. And I got a telephone call on the Sunday morning. Would I meet up with Tony and go up there? So we went up there, found that it had been damaged. And there were two people with a van. And we unloaded the stuff 
from the store into the van to take it to what we found out later was uh, Captain Shackle's farm, Manor Farm at uh, Swainswick. And when we got there and unloaded the explosive, we found that one of the boxes which contained the, the uh, sticky bombs, which had nitroglycerine in it, had something oily around the edge of it. Well, nitroglycerine looked a bit oily, and this looked a bit suspicious, so uh, we very, very gingerly picked it up because nitroglycerine is not the sort of stuff you play with, carried it across two fields into a ditch, and did what they call today a controlled explosives, explosion, which made a very satisfying bang uh, in the middle of a Sunday afternoon. I presume that people weren't worried because there'd been an air raid the night before and you did get unexploded, unexpected uh, bangs during the war. But it could have been nasty, particularly as we'd driven it all the way through town and we had nearly a hundred weight of um, gel ignite and other explosives on board in the van. <laughs> if the sticky bombs had decided to go off, there would have been trouble. Uh, I could see a police court nowadays evacuating the farm for like five miles around. <laughs> A little bit about the sabotage <coughs> against the aircraft at Colin. <coughs> oh, that was our most successful operation, the the sabotage at Colin. It was an exercise arranged between three patrols. We didn't know it at the time, but three patrols were to attack Colin Airport uh, airfield from different points over the night to check out the newly formed uh, RAF uh, bat battalion. We had the southern side, and if anybody's listening who knows it, the Vineyards Cafe in those days, or at least the Vineyards uh, Restaurant as it is nowadays, was then a farmhouse, and we were attacking from that side. Well, we had Colin Airfield as a possible target on our list for a long time, and had done reconnaissance around it, so we thought we knew the, er the area fairly well. We met up at the three shire stones coming out of Bath and went across the farmland towards the airfield. It was a, a bank and round under the bank with the sergeant light leading. Suddenly we heard a ruckus and somebody said, we've got one of them. So the sergeant who was going point had been picked up at a machine gun post that hadn't been there two or three nights before. They'd obviously put this sandbag post in. Well, he created a heck of a noise as they dragged him across the field and doing this. So we had a quick conference and thought, well, there's nothing much you can do except go on. We know there's trouble there, we can avoid it. So as we crawled round, we were surprised to find this sandbag post with a Lewis gun lying on the top of the sandbags, nobody there. So we thought we got a free gun. So we took the Lewis gun and just to show that we'd been friendly, we had these time pencils with a 10 minute delay on them. And we stuck one in a potato with a detonator and put it down by the side of the uh, machine gun post. And we crawled further along to where there was a road, or at least a farm track, leading up to the road we wanted to cross. And we set up the machine gun so that it would cover down the road where we could see a group of soldiers and a lorry and that and people moving about. Well, it wasn't very long later than we heard a loud shout, the bloody gun's gone. So... We thought, aye, aye, they found out the gun's gone. And with that, there was a loud bang as our detonator went off. And we thought, well, that'll give us enough distraction. So one stayed by the gun to, so say, cover the road. And the other three rolled across the road into the ditch, which we knew was there. And we knew that the link fencing they had around, that if you were in the ditch, you could come up the other side of the link fencing. So we left the gun in the bushes, rolled across into the uh, field, on the edge of the airfield. Uh, this was the garden of what was now what is now the uh, vineyards restaurant. We thought for a bit and then uh, we saw somebody come along with the sergeant and bung him in a little outhouse. So we waited and thought, well, if somebody's bunged him, we haven't seen anybody else go in there. There can't be all that sort of people around. Let's get the sergeant out. Now we'd planned that as an identification letter we'd use the Morse letter X, da 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 da, which we could flash on a pencil torch or knock or just to let, let the people know it was you. So we went up to the door 
and not dog the da on the door to let him know it was us outside, put our shoulders to the door and very fortunately it went in. The sergeant was lying on the bed and there was just one airman lying on another bed. So he jumped in and said, you're a dead mate, uh, and said to the sergeant, uh, well, what do we do now? Well, he said, let, let, let's carry on as before. So he left one chap with the airman, and he had a truncheon with him, so he, uh, I'll show you, that's nice, nice, nice cot uh, to keep him quiet. And we came out and moved towards the entrance of the farmhouse, which was being used as the headquarters. And there was a bean fence, run a bean fence, which we lay down behind and watched what happened. And somebody came along and knocked on the door, and there was a voice inside shouted, come, and the door opened and he went in, and two minutes later he came out. And the sergeant says, if he can do that, we can. So we went up and banged on the door and the voice shouted, come, and we all charged in, waving our fighting knives and pistols. And very fortunately for us, there was um, one of the exercise umpires in there too. So we said, uh, we think we've taken over the office. And he turned to the captain who was there and he said, I think they have. Captain Hope Hall. Now, I've never seen a chap purple with rage, but there was a flight sergeant there from the uh, RAF regiment. And he had a vein on his neck that was throbbing. So what he said to the men next day, I have no idea. But he was furious. You know, I've never seen anybody who was literally going to explode. So while we were there, there was another knock on the door. So the sergeant signalled two of us to go to the side of the door and shouted, come. And when he came in, he said, I've come to collect the prisoner. By that time, he was flat on the floor uh, with his knee in his back. So uh, he said, uh, what are you going to do now? He said, well, I'd throw a Mills bomb in. I said, I've got a Mills bomb. So the umpire said, well, I think you're dead too. So we said to the umpire, well, you can assume that we've wrecked this, we've wrecked the telephone. We shall now proceed through on, into the airfield. So we went out of the back door into the airfield, wrote rude words on two or three aeroplanes, and went back home feeling very satisfied with ourselves. I understand that the RAF regiment were grounded for a fortnight afterwards, and you don't show up in home guard uniform in a pub with the RAF regiment <laughs> because you got into trouble. But it was, a, it was a very successful exercise. One thing it did teach you was to think on your feet because things happened so, it was the first time we'd done anything like that, and things happened so fast that you had to learn to, what, what, what am I going to do next? You had half a second to make your mind up. The motto of the auxiliary units was, ready when called. Uh, thank goodness they were never called. If they had, I shouldn't be talking to you now. It was, um, no, it was, um, it was just one of those things that was set up at the time. And as I said earlier, once you were into 1941, the danger of invasion had gone. It didn't help my career particularly, but the one thing it did do was to give you confidence. You grew up from being uh, a 16-year-old to being a 20-year-old, knowing you could handle yourself, knowing that you could think fast, you could handle weapons. Uh, and gave, gave your confidence. I think the main thing you got from it was a personal confidence. Although the auxiliary units wore the Home Guard uniform, this was only a, a cover for their activities so they could move about and not be questioned too much about what they were doing. They were in fact a civilian unit. They had no military connections at all. They weren't protected by the Geneva Convention and if they'd been caught, they'd have been caught as franc tireurs and shot on sight. They weren't even allowed any medals. It's only in the last three years that they've managed to get the award of the Defence Medal. We were given, uh, at the end of the war, the, the badge of the auxiliary units as an indication that we'd been in it, but no military award and no military recognition. But we have been recognised by the Special Forces Club and we're now members of the Special Forces Club with the SAS and the SOE, so, although we didn't do anything, we're with the big boys. <laughs>